Um, so hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. My name is Celine Funky and I am a fifth year on the softball team here at U of L. Um, my undergraduate degree was in finance and I will be graduating with my MBA this spring. Uh, so throughout the 2020-2021 school year, I have had the pleasure of serving as the president of SAC here at U of L. SAC stands for Student Athlete Advisory Committee, and I also serve as the ACC SAC chairperson. Uh, so the goal of SAC is really just to be the liaison between senior staff and student athletes. Um, we have representatives from all of our teams on campus, and they relay concerns and questions that their teammates have on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we then work with senior leadership to make changes that will improve upon the student athlete experience. And as many of you probably could have guessed, this year one of the hottest topics for us has been name, image, and likeness. Uh, so my letter addresses NIL and is from the perspective of an Olympic sport, non-revenue student athlete, which I don't think has been heard up to this point. So in order to create an even playing field um, within collegiate athletics, it's critical that a national standard is enacted before state laws take effect as early as this summer. Uh, this national standard needs to consider the effect it will have on all student athletes, as some legislators have suggested um, completely overhauling the current collegiate model, um, which would be detrimental to non-revenue sports. I think it's also important to mention some of the benefits that student athletes have. Um, I know that they're listed in my letter, but I really just wanted to highlight a few of them again today. So in addition to our scholarship, we have meals and nutrition guidance, some of us receive room and board, um, which goes straight to the student athlete to help cover living expenses, um, as well as we receive full medical care um, that's free of charge, not to mention tutors to help on the academic side of things, um, as well as career counseling to prepare us for life after sport. Um, and as it is today, non-revenue sports really survive on the profit sharing model by using the popularity of basketball and football. Um, this model works because it provides education for the most student athletes possible. Um, and therefore, in order to protect the majority of student athletes uh, and the student athlete experience that kids dream about, these NIL modernization laws um, must protect the revenue sharing model that offers so many of us the opportunity to play at the collegiate level. Um, finally, uh, college athletes or college athletics should remain college athletics. I love my team and I love my sport, but I know that finance is uh, what's gonna change my life and my degree in finance. And I just don't want young women that look up to uh, my teammates and I to miss that opportunity. So thank you all for having me today. And before we go into q and I'll, I'll hand it off to Vince with any additional comments. Yeah, I think, Kenny, do you wanna do Q&A first uh, with Celine? So yeah, she can let's get do that so she can okay. get to practice, yeah. So we'll okay. go ahead and open it up for questions uh, uh, for Celine. If you have a question, if you would just drop a note in the chat and we'll get to you. Start with a question from Tim Sullivan. Got to unmute, Tim. Sorry. Hi, Celine. Tim Sullivan with the Courier Journal. Uh, a couple of points uh, regarding your concern about uh, how this NIL might come down. Uh, your fear—I don't want to put words in your mouth—but uh, what what is it you're worried about in terms of how it might manifest itself and what impact that might have on uh, non-revenue sports? Yeah, I think that the main point is um, that we're for NIL modernization. We know that it's been a, a long time coming and that something does have to change. But I think that the most important point is that this revenue sharing um, by using the popularity of football and basketball, um, it has to stay intact or else non-revenue sports just simply won't survive. Okay. Um, as a follow-up, one of the criticisms of the current collegiate model is that the uh, revenue sports are populated heavily by African Americans and the, the model essentially benefits Caucasians uh, in non-revenue sports. Do you think that's equitable and uh, how would you respond to, uh, to that kind of criticism? Yeah, I mean, I think as the leader of SAC here at Louisville and, and in the ACC, I talk to athletes on, on all of our teams, um, and that's just not how the college athletes are looking at this. Um, I know that some people from the outside might might say that and have, have other things to say about that, but that's just not what I'm hearing from college athletes. Um, we all support one another, and we want a system where all of us get a, an equal educational opportunity. 
Um, and we all think that we should be compensated for NIL rights when it comes to endorsements, camps, or even promoting our personal YouTube channel. So I think that's just the the narrative from the student athletes that I've I've had the opportunity to speak to. Okay. In your uh, particular sport, what revenue possibilities do you see? Um, I think looking back on my time, I think that I could have benefited from from, you know, posting on my Instagram, telling them that I'm home for the summer and that I'm giving lessons and things like that. Because right now, as the as the legislation stands, we're not allowed to do that. It's all word of mouth. Um, and so I think that's where some people can really benefit. Um, and like I said, just doing camps and with YouTube taking off, um, I think that that's another, another avenue for some of us in non-revenue sports. Thank you. To uh, John Lewis. Uh, you kind of answered my question there, but to kind of expound on that, what when you talk about modernization, what are some of the things that you would like to see changed or maybe like the rules? Do uh, you want to see a blanket for everyone in collegiate athletics or what what when you when you say modernization of these rules, what exactly are you talking about? Maybe like a scenario of what you would like to see changed? Yeah, I think uh, the example that I gave is I know that there's been, uh, situations in the past where some student athletes have had to pick between making money on their YouTube channel or remaining a college athlete. And I don't know that they should have to make that decision. I think that um, our normal students on campus are allowed to make money off of, off of let's just use YouTube as an example. Um, and so I think that student athletes should have that opportunity as well. Um, so yes, I think it should be, you know, all overall sports. Um, but I think that YouTube, I guess, is just the example that I would use there. But um, and even having the opportunity to promote yourself for camps and different things, like I just mentioned, that I could have benefited from softball. Um, that's more of the modernization that I think that that we're referencing here. Thank you. To Jody Demling. Hey, Celine, it's Jody Demling with Cardinal Authority. You mentioned that the feed. You, you mentioned the uh, the other uh, athletes and that. What's the feedback you have gotten in the last? 24 hours because I saw some stuff on Twitter and things. What what has the majority of the feedback been? And and I'm assuming there's probably maybe been some negative as well. Yeah, um, I think that I was ready for for both sides of it when when I decided to publish that. But um, really, the great great majority has been very positive. All my um, fellow student athletes have been extremely supportive and and thanked me for putting that narrative out because as I said before, I think that um, you know we've had different former student athletes, current student athletes um, speak on it, but I don't know that there's been a narrative from the non-revenue sports. And I just wanted to make sure that I touched on that. And I think that all the student athletes, and like you said on Twitter and, and everything like that have been very, very supportive and appreciative of, of my comments. Any further questions for Celine? Celine, um you know, she's a she's a star student and a star athlete here on campus. Uh, you kind of heard her accolades of being, you know, kind of chair in the ACC uh, SAC committee as well as president on campus. She's got great respect from the student athletes across our conference, and it's, you know, we're talking about ten thousand athletes, um, you know, across the uh, you know our fifteen members. So there's quite a bit. She gets a lot of input, um, but you know, she's great at bringing those any issues. Um, to me and wanting to discuss them. She's been kind of a mentee for me that I get opportunity to work with. And uh, when she, when we've sat down about name him to likeness, it's, it's interesting. She studied the topic and her, um, even her understanding of viewpoints have evolved even over the course of the last year um, as more legislation is put out and she follows it. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge piece. She knows that she'll be gone, but she's obviously got great interest in what it looks like after she's, Finished her eligibility and uh, and academics here in May. Uh, could I'm, I'm not sure what the next biggest piece of legislation would be that you know it has been passed or is going to be passed. Uh, you know the transfer legislation doesn't compare to this in my mind in terms of what we're doing in the name of Jalikus. I mean I know people talk about Title IX legislation and so forth, but it's a the name of Jalikus is you know it's a very complex issue, and if it wasn't, it probably would have already been solved. Uh, but it's it's one that's made it easy to kind of kick the can on. But I feel like today, um, you know, the NCAA, college athletics, however you want to put it, is on the clock. And we need to get it resolved. 
there's certainly bipartisan support for legislation, but then there's a great deal of difference of opinion on whether it should be at the state or the federal level and um, and the viewpoints around that. So to me, the federal level is the is really the only clear path. I know we've had six states pass laws, but um, you know, having this patchwork of, of state legislation that differs uh, in some cases significantly is is not a good pathway, particularly when it comes to recruiting and uh you know and, and things around that i'm certainly concerned about that but uh but not only do the politicians have a different viewpoint the thing that makes us even more complex is that the members of division one had different views so you're, you're probably going to hear a different view from probably eastern and western kentucky from what you may hear from from us at louisville and, and even down the road at kentucky and and i think that's what makes it a tall challenge for the ncaa is there's so many members of division one but what they think may be right uh, inside the division one uh, could differ. So, you know, it's easy to say, let's just pay the players. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences there that that will happen uh, or could happen, particularly around recruiting. But um, we don't need quick decisions. I know it, we're, we're running up against the July one time frame, particularly as it relates to the Florida state law. But, you know, those quick decisions can't be made by politicians just to earn votes or uh, or have somebody uh, try to gain notoriety for making an uneducated viewpoint here on the topic. It just, it muddies it up. But recruiting inducements and, and compliance and how agents fit into all this is uh, is a difficult one. And I, I, I get to play with this area inside the ACC as we talk about it on a name, image, and likeness uh, kind of subcommittee. And uh, we're close. I feel like some of the more recent legislation that come out seems to get closer. Uh, some of the bills, but uh, we'll see. And uh, but I'm hopeful that by July one, uh, that we'll have the proper guardrails in place. And then um, what I think will be an improvement to the collegiate model. Uh, I'm certainly you can hear my voice. I'm for the name, image, and likeness legislation, and um, would like to see the student athletes have the same rights as students and their ability to to go make money. And you know, if my son who's on campus here has his own ways of doing it. Uh, through Instagram, and uh, I think there'll be student athletes that'll follow on the same uh, pattern once the, uh, the the legislation's in place. But with that, I'll I'll stop, Kenny. I could probably go on for hours, but open any questions there may be for me. Yeah, and if you have a question, just drop it in the yeah. chat. We'll go to Tim to start. Yeah, Vince. Uh, a lot of this uh, NIL legislation probably hinges on the Supreme Court decision and whether there's antitrust protection. Do you f see how that or do you see that impacting the sentiments of, uh, of people in Division One? Uh, if you don't get that protection, you know, what does that mean and, and how do you foresee this uh, playing out? Yeah, I think it's important to have it, uh, but I don't think it needs to be broad antitrust legislation. I think it can be narrowed and I think that's what will end up happening, uh, particularly if it is sitting at the federal level. Um, there, are, there are a number of things being discussed, as you can imagine, but I, I do foresee something happening and there being, uh, I would like to believe that there's going to be some very narrow antitrust legislation that comes along with it so that we can maintain the collegiate model. Is that uh mean that uh, or does that mean that, uh, that you expect limits on compensation or how, I do not. how would that uh, come come down? Yeah, I don't think there'll be limits on compensation because I think there are some, you know, there are going to be some athletes who are pretty creative and not necessarily just a, uh, frankly, a, a men's basketball player or a football player. I think uh, you know, there's there's athletes who have great followings for different things that however they've created those followers on their their social media that they'll be able to leverage it in a way that, you know, we may be surprised, you know, outliers that are earning significant amounts of, uh, of money. Um, but I, I think it's but I don't see it being uh, where we set limits. I'm not sure what would be enough, Tim, if someone said, hey, every kid should be paid 20,000 or 30,000 or 50,000. When is enough enough, particularly if you really think you're a a first rounder in a sport. I, I couldn't begin to set what I thought would be the limit today. I just think if they got the ability to for name image and likeness, um, I think the bigger discussions get around whether they can use the the variances of opinion, whether they can use the university marks 
I think if they want to apply to get the license and marks like any other student or business would, they want to go down that path, so be it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think they're guardrails, but I'm certainly for uh, figuring out how we're going to support their success in this program. Do you see yourself as an outlier uh, philosophically on this? Uh, where Where is the, the consensus on, on this issue? No, I think I'm probably more in the sweet spot overall. I think as you talk about the autonomy five, and I do think there are variances of, of, of views on, um, you know, if I said between, uh, and I'm not speaking for Eastern Kentucky, but let's say a mid-major versus a, a, a power five school. I think there are going to be some differences, some view that uh, opening up uh, avails the athletic department, maybe a chance to go talk to corporate partners that they haven't had a chance to talk to before. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for us, I, I, I don't see that uh, as a real, you know, advantage. I think we do well with what we do in sponsorships. Um, I think that's some of the risk people worry about is would sponsors try to move over or second and third, third tier sponsors uh, go for supporting a student athlete versus the department. But there'll be legislation to protect these quote unquote boosters or supporters from also um, paying athletes. That's just, I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I could see like a second or third tier company in the community that says, geez, I really want to get behind this great athlete or, you know, they they seem like they have a great track record, good kid, good student, whatever, and put them on the billboard or put them on a commercial. Thank you. Uh, John Lewis. Tim stole my thunder again, but I'll ask it maybe in a different way here uh, or a different question. Are you, you said you're kind of in the sweet spot and that, that some people um, uh, kind of agree with you on the on the outlook of it. Are you starting to see maybe the NCAA coming around a little more now to all this? And are you optimistic that uh, if it were up to them that maybe they could, they say, yeah, this is something that we need to really pass because it's, it's, it's finally time. Yeah, John, that's a, it's a great question, particularly when you pose it to the NCAA stance, I think to answer your question, they would have already done it. Um, I feel like it's uh, it's taken a lot of other push and pull to get, um, you know, the NCAA to the finish line here. And I really think that um, you can't let great get in the way of good, to use that cliche, that, um, you know, we can get there. And there it doesn't have to be the final product. Uh, I think that's the thing is most legislation that goes into place over time, it evolves. And I think that this is one that there's so many uh, nuances to it that I, I'm, it's clear in my mind that there's going to be amendments and edits to the legislation along the way, but that shouldn't prohibit it from being put in place. And I think we're, we've given a lot of guidance. I know the Autonomy 5 has. I know I'm proud to say the ACC has been outspoken about it. I've been involved in that. Um, and hopefully we're we're close enough to help the NCAA because they're in a very difficult spot when you got variances of opinions from members that have uh, very diverse uh, or, or very disparate budgets, operating budgets to start with. Andrew. Hey Vince. Yeah, I mean, even just talking about what's going on around college sports right now, you saw the news about Michigan State renaming, I guess, some of their official name inside the Breslin Center, Michigan State, presented by Rocket Mortgage Insurance. When athletes, student athletes, see things like that more and more as we're going down that path where there is more sponsorship, more money to these programs, do you think that that sort of fuels them even more? Seeing, hey, there's these companies are throwing millions of dollars into these programs, but we're still not technically getting our opportunities to, I guess, make money. And I guess going off of that. How much of a generational gap do you think there is because the leadership in the NCAA aren't student athletes? And obviously it's a new era right now with what these student athletes are living in. Yeah, I, th I think to your first question, I think because it's so pronounced in the media at times about, you know, pay the players, pay the players, that sometimes they do probably take a pause. But I think if they didn't see the investment in their programs, um, if they didn't see the investment into their facilities and you know, having nutritionists and chiropractors and all the medical services and uh, the tutors. I mean, we've got, I think, 75 tutors that assist our uh, academic performance. If they didn't see the reinvestment in the programs uh, that happens, 
uh, I think there'd be greater concern that, boy, they're just taking all the profits. But it, it doesn't show up on the, um, you know, the operating statements that are that are produced from the um, from the departments. You know, I think that's the biggest thing we look at here is when we value, quote unquote, value what a scholarship is here. It gets pretty significant when you start adding in all the things we do and put them on private planes versus on buses when I played. Uh, I would love to have had the experience that they're having now, you know, versus paying for my own travel shirt, uh, you know, travel polo to uh, to go versus what they receive today. It, it there's a generational difference between I played when I played and they're, they're, you know, what they get today. We talk about that in meetings and they get a kick out of hearing my corny stories, but uh, I think it's terrific what they get. I hope they're going to get a lot more down the road and then along with it, the ability to earn their additional income. Um, but I would tell you, though, a lot of those, when we sign a, you know, a corporate s- sponsorship, let's say it's UPS or Kroger or one of these, I mean, they really don't sit here and say who you're recruiting or who's going to be the next star or even the current star is. I mean, they, they're supporting the athletic department. They're supporting the university and what we provide. I mean, when they sign a 10-year agreement, they have no idea who's going to come and go from the program during those 10 years. So they're not resting on individuals. They're resting on what the uh, the athletic department and the university represent.